SBU is the Spina Bifida Association's new viral education program. Our goal is to bring the world's best care providers and resources directly into your home. SBU is the only free webinar series dedicated solely to the educational, employment, social, self-advocacy, and health needs of people with spina bifida. We hope that you will enjoy this presentation, Hydrocephalus Anatomy, Physiology, Diagnosis, and Shunt Placement. This session was recorded at the 2010 Spina Bifida Learning Conference hosted by the Spina Bifida Association of Alabama and the Children's Hospital of Alabama. Please be sure to take time to complete the evaluation at the close of the presentation. This morning, at least according to the syllabus, is talking a bit about hydrocephalus, shunts, and uh, tethered cord. So I'm happy to, uh, to, to do that. So any talk about, oh, by the way, at, at any time, if anybody has questions or things like that, please, if I, if I haven't made something clear, please, please let me know because I, I want to be as clear as we possibly can. So what we're going to talk about this morning for the time that I have with you is hydrocephalus, which is fundamentally a disorder of the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. So what is it? Where is it made? How does cerebrospinal fluid circulate and get reabsorbed? There are different types of, of spinal fluid abnormalities, communicating and non-commuting hydrocephalus, and what are the types of problems that occur with the shunt systems that we have in place right now. The slides are sort of a go-by, and I, I hope to amplify on them with some of the most sort of current information that we might have available. Well, as a basic starting point, cerebrospinal fluid is a clear water-like fluid that contains salt and sugar that's made in the ventricles of the brain. Ventricles are hollow cavities that I always say to people should normally be about the size of your index finger. Okay, that's the normal size. And they're C-shaped, and they sit in the head, kind of right straight back from the mid part of the eyebrow, and then they're C-shaped, and they come around to just around in front of the ear in what's called the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And within those spaces lie some little nests of tissue that for all the world, when we look at it surgically, looks like kind of an orangey-pink seaweed tissue. And from that tissue clear watery fluid is generated almost like a filtrate of blood. It's not just a filter. There's actually a chemical energy dependent process that's required for this fluid to come out from the choroid plexus. But you can almost think of it that way. The blood flows in and this clear watery fluid flows out. Okay, and that clear watery fluid is the cerebrospinal fluid. That fluid has some sugar in it. It has some salt in it. And it serves to circulate all around the brain and the nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, and it serves as a buffer, okay? It serves to protect the brain and the spinal fluid so that when you move your head or, or get bumped or anything like that, it serves as a buffer. It also buffers it in terms of temperature. The physiologic functions of the cerebrospinal fluid are multiple. We don't even know all of them. So to say that it's just a buffer is the ultimate simplification. There are many, many functions, but globally probably its single biggest function appears to be that of a buffer. So the spinal fluid is continuously made, and it's made within these ventricles. And as the diagram on the left shows, that's a cut through the brain as if you're looking at it from the front. Trying to see if I got a pointer. Uh, as, as if you're looking at it from the front. And those pinky like tissue, or those pinky like uh, surfaces within the ventricle is the choroid plexus. Now, what's most important is the diagram there on the right that's entitled Circulation of Cerebrospinal Fluid. Because if you look very carefully at the diagram, you'll see there's some black arrows. And what those black arrows are designed to indicate is that the cerebrospinal fluid is made in the ventricles, and then it follows a very carefully defined flow pattern. And as you see, the predominant arrows end up sort of pointing downward in the middle of the brain. And then they come all the way down through what's called the fourth ventricle, uh, just in front of the cerebellum there, and then it comes out at the base of the brain. At that point, the spinal fluid gains access to all the space in the spine. And that's where most laypersons 
have had uh, some exposure to the notion of cerebrospinal fluid because that's where a spinal tap is done. When a, a needle is introduced into the low back, the cerebrospinal fluid can be collected, and we do that to look for meningitis and things like that. Once the CSF is in that space, then it can come back up over the surface of the brain and enter into the, um, enter into the uh, arachnoid granulations up way at the top underneath that blue bar. The blue bar there indicates the venous circulation, and that's where that fluid then goes back into. So it's a continuous sort of one-way circulation where it's made in the ventricles, circulates through some very delicate little narrow passageways, comes back up over the surface of the brain and then gets reabsorbed. Well, the vulnerable point in that physiologic pathway is, of course, the delicate little narrow passageways that the cerebrospinal fluid has to circulate through and past. And any process that significantly impacts the central nervous system can disturb those narrow little passageways. We see it in kids that have had infections, kids that have had bad trauma and had bleeding in their brain, kids that are born too early and get bleeding as a result of the immaturity of their blood vessels. Some kids just have a congenital narrowing of those pathways. And of course, spina bifida is a big population because while the defect on the back is an obvious problem, anyone with any familiarity with spina bifida recognizes that there are problems structural and functional throughout the nervous system. So that a lot of these delicate little narrow passageways just simply either don't exist or are very, very small in people who have spina bifida. So about 70 to 80 percent of people who have spina bifida end up with some sort of blockage of those pathways and come to need some help with maintaining nor normal spinal fluid dynamics. If there's a blockage, it does not slow down or reduce the production of spinal fluid so it continues to be made. And when that happens, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So spinal fluid is, is circulated and reabsorbed and the diagram down at the bottom shows that process where from that pinky space there up into the blue venous spaces, that's where the cerebrospinal fluid is continuously reabsorbed as a very dynamic process. And then the ventricles, again, are diagrammed on the right, those C-shaped C structures. And that's about the right size and configuration of what the ventricles should look like. Okay? Now, the ventricles are changed in, in spina bifida, and they do take on a little bit different appearance. But the fundamental concept here is spinal fluid is continuously made regardless of whether it's reabsorbed. So there has to be a mechanism for the body to get the, the spinal fluid out of the ventricles or it will build up and cause pressure, okay? So as we talked about, any process that disturbs normal circulation and reabsorption of CSF can cause a relative backup called hydrocephalus. And of course, with the multitude of issues, structural issues with um, myelomeningocele, uh, it's no surprise that that does not And these are the types of changes that we see in the patient who has, who has um, myelomeningocele with the obliteration, narrowing of the normal pathways, some of the changes that occur in the posterior fossa, and the fact that, that uh, myelomeningocele involves the entire nervous system leads us to a situation where, as I alluded, 80% of people with um, spina bifida will have some form of hydrocephalus. Okay, so how, do, how does, classically, how does um, hydrocephalus show up? Well, characteristically, in young children, particularly kids who have spina bifida, how do we know that they have hydrocephalus? How do we sort out the seven out of eight that need something done from the one out of eight that doesn't? Well, characteristically, we'll see a couple of things happen. Most commonly, in the newborn child, cerebrospinal fluid will be leaking from, from the site, from the closure, or from the, from the defect, from this, okay? When we close that surgically, we eliminate the cerebrospinal fluid's capability to do that. So leaking from our closure site, or less commonly in spina bifida kids, an increase in the overall size of the infant's head can give, give us the clue that that child is going to be one of the ones that needs to have help, that needs to have something done. Most of the time, the something is a shunt. We're going to talk a lot about shunts here in just a moment. Most of the time, that something is a shunt. We'll touch on this procedure called endoscopic third ventriculostomy because many people are, have questions about it and have heard about it. Um, but before I do that, I want to just bring up one of the sort of current uh, 
controversies, bring you from the very basics to the sort of the frontier, as it were, to the edge. We are looking at, when I say we, I mean my, my colleagues and friends who do pediatric neurosurgery, looking at the issue of whether or not we can decrease the number of infants that we shunt. As many of you are familiar, um, shunts have a lot of problems with them. Shunts are the greatest thing and the worst thing that ever, ever existed. They have unequivocally saved the lives of thousands of people throughout the 25, 30, 40 years that they've been in, in, existed. But that's come at a cost, and the cost is a constant, um, a constant awareness of the possibility and the, and the likelihood of shunt failure, the very, rea the very real situation that shunts are mechanical devices, they block, they get infected, and there is a natural state of so-called shunt dependency that arises when we put these shunt drainage tubes in. Many of these natural processes that exist, to what degree they exist already in a patient with spina bifida, tend to kind of close down a little bit so that the shunt becomes the primary route by which uh, that patient metabolizes and handles their cerebrospinal fluid. So there is a shunt dependency that arises. And in a device that is as, as imperfect as a shunt, the state of shunt dependency has a natural problem built into it. You become very dependent on a fallible, imperfect device, and that leads to a, a, a real and a, a real measurable uh, problem for many, many people. So we're looking at this trying to say, do we really need to shunt 80%? Are we pulling the trigger for shunts too early? And one of my friends and um, colleagues who works at a major center in Chicago, the Children's Memorial Group, her name's Robin Bowman, is looking at this question very carefully, and she's trying to widen the boundaries for which we insert shunts. And she's tolerating a little bit more rounded ventricles. She's tolerating a little bit more head growth before it triggers the decision to put a shunt in. Now, is this the right decision or the wrong decision? Well, this is an issue that we're working on and we don't know. What's the potential trade-off? Well, her success is that she's driven the incidence of new shunts from about 80%, which is where most of the centers around the country are running, down to about 55%. So that's a significant decrease. Sounds great at first pass, but what data don't we have? What is the long-term neuropsychological and neurocognitive effect of larger, more stretched ventricles that may be under a little higher pressure? Are these kids that aren't being shunted and are free of the shunt-dependent shunt lifestyle, are these kids going to take a 10-point IQ hit, a 20-point IQ hit, a visuospatial processing problem? Is there going to be a neurocognitive impact of more stretch on the ventricle, more stretch on the white matter that surrounds the ventricle? We just don't know yet. So at present, at present, this is a sort of one center, two center type of thing, but these are the types of questions. I pose this to you to exemplify the types of questions that are kind of out there on the edge of what we're trying to figure out, what we're trying to, or what we're trying to look at. Now, of course, the proper way to, to investigate such a problem is to do it collaboratively, carefully organized across multiple centers, but that'll take time and that'll take money. So that question's not going to be answered in the next 12 months or two years, but those are the types of issues that are out there, okay? So back to sort of the basics. So in, sorry, in younger kids, we, in, in babies, we know these are the things that we look for that tell us that we need to deal with the cerebrospinal fluid. And then in children, the characteristic things that we look for are things that you all are well familiar with, headache, vomiting, sleepiness, and a cognitive decline. That's in the young kids. However, the spina bifida population has some specific and very particular signs that need to be watched for. And the one that we can't emphasize enough is the importance of neck pain. Neck pain in the patient with spina bifida, and it's characteristically a sort of neck pain type of headache. Neck pain in a teen or an adult with spina bifida, we, carry, we hold in our clinic 
is shunt failure until we prove otherwise, okay? So headaches, of course, are important, but spina bifida patients are a little bit different in the way that they present in that they can present with a lot of neck pain or the usual headaches and, and sleepiness. The other thing that, they, that can happen is that some of the other problems that come along with spina bifida and myelomeningocele can be shunt, signs of shunt failure. So early signs of the tethered cord problem often relates back to shunt function. And the thinking on that goes something like this. There are a variety of structural changes, differences, abnormalities, challenges in the individual with myelomeningocele. So that the, the normal reserves are compromised. They're living day to day with their reserves exhausted. So that when their system is stressed in any way, they become symptomatic. Well, what is the most fragile, most frequent source of an overall stress to the nervous system? Well, it has to do with CSF dynamics. And what's the most common reason for a stress for CSF dynamics? Well, it's the shunt. So Jack Walker, who's a very accomplished and esteemed colleague of mine, who many of you may know or have heard of or have, have, have read, is known for saying it's it's always the shunt stupid. It's it's the shunt stupid. It's the shunt stupid. So that sounds ultimately reductionistic and simplistic, but that's sort of the rationale behind it. These are compromised nervous systems that are very sensitive to any change at all. And what change makes the biggest impact in their overall functioning is their CSF dynamics. So if the CSF dynamics are stressed via a subtle change in the competency of the shunt, then it can manifest as a variety of different other problems around the nervous system. So the types of things may be like symptoms from a tethered cord, back pain, a change in lower extremity function. Believe it or not, that can be a sign of a shunt problem in the person with spina bifida. Similarly, if the Chiari 2 becomes symptomatic, and I wasn't specifically tasked with talking about Chiari 2, but all these issues run together when thinking about the dynamics of someone with, uh, with uh, thinking about the nervous systems of, of persons with myelomeningocele and spina bifida. The, the, the Chiari 2 can manifest itself with problems with swallowing in babies with strider, all of these types of what, are, what we call bulbar functions. All of those can indicate a problem with the shunt. Okay? It's not the most common. The most common is still headache, sleepiness, generalized sense of being unwell, throwing up, neck pain. Okay? That's probably 80% what we see. But the astute clinician, the experienced, educated family will have an awareness of these things outside the bound, outside the simple headache, vomiting, throwing up, or headache, sleepiness, vomiting, excuse me. Okay, so this is what the pictures look like. You saw those diagrams I showed you before of kind of what the normal ventricles look like. And this is just a collage of different patients that I've taken care of over the years that have too much cerebrospinal fluid in their head. When we take pictures of CSF, CSF cerebrospinal fluid, we take pictures of CSF, it's black. And you see those, oh, how much black there is on those scans, that's too much, okay? Those ventricles are distended, and as you can see from the diagrams, the ventricles can, dis can distend in a symmetric or an asymmetric way. So how do we treat this? Well, it's pretty simple. We either send the cerebrospinal fluid a different route, letting it be absorbed by another body surface that can absorb it, and that's the whole shunt deal. Or we can make an alternative pathway, and this is, this is my prompt to talk to you about endoscopic third ventriculostomy. The notion with endoscopic third ventriculostomy, I'm going to go back to another, to, to another picture that I had here. Give me just one moment. Um, is that we, and I want to direct your attention to the diagram that we talked about before on the right, the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid one. The notion with the endoscopic third ventriculostomy is that it gives the CSF a pathway, an alternate pathway to get around to the side of the circulation where it gets reabsorbed. 
so that the spinal fluid, instead of having to go through some of those blocked off, narrow, delicate passageways, c goes directly through the floor of the third ventricle. Now, I don't have a good pointer with me right here, but I can describe this very well. If you look down at the bottom of that diagram on the right, and you see that little circular thing kind of hanging down like a cherry there. If you all see that? Just above that little cherry-like thing hanging down, that's the pituitary gland. Just above that and to the right, there's a little tiny white arrow. And that's the subarachnoid space just outside of the bottom of the third ventricle, which is the yellow part above it. So if we were with a surgical instrument to make a passageway through there, the cerebrospinal fluid would have a shortcut to get through to the space where it gets reabsorbed. Now, when somebody has hydrocephalus, it stretches out those pathways, stretches out those floors, so that that floor becomes very thin and takes on the surgical appearance like waxed paper. You can't see through it like you can saran wrap, but it's translucent, okay? So when we can take a surgical instrument and make a hole through there, then that gives an alternative pathway for the cerebrospinal fluid to get around and become reabsorbed on the other side, on the absorptive side of the circulation. That's the rationale behind this procedure called endoscopic third ventriculostomy, or ETV. Okay, if you read much about hydrocephalus, you can't miss it. It's out there. Why? What's so good about it? No shunt. Okay? You give the fluid an alternate pathway, you don't need a shunt. Okay? Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that kids with spina bifida have a much, much lower success rate for ETV than other populations of kids with hydrocephalus. Okay? A variety of reasons make that the case we must remember that while the back, the open back, is the most obvious sign of structural differences within the person with myelomeningocele, it's obvious, it's right out there. We must remember that the structural changes in the nervous system run the gamut from top to bottom. Okay? Some things are bigger, some things are littler. Some things are more stretched out, some things are more packed together. The, the structural changes run from front to back. As a general rule, the floor that we need to make the hole through is thicker, is rubberier. There's no such word, but you all know what I mean. Okay? It doesn't act like wax paper. It acts like a floor of rubber band. Okay? And that's not so good when you're trying to make a hole through it and not pull on structures adjacent. Okay? You pull on structures adjacent and you can get all kinds of problems, problems with movements of the eyes and things like that. So that in virtually every series, there are more complications and a lower success rate in people who have spina bifida with endoscopic third ventriculostomy than with hydrocephalus from other, other etiologies. Okay? So, whether or not you, your child, your loved one, or whomever you're interested in is a candidate is something that needs to be very, very carefully worked out. But it would be an error for us as a group that cares about spina bifida and patients with myelomeningocele to look to ETV like it's going to be the panacea that's going to get rid of the need for shunts. It's just not the case. Okay? There is probably the, the uncommon patient who has spina bifida who may be a good candidate for endoscopic third. But I think we have to be very reserved in our enthusiasm about this particular procedure in treating hydrocephalus in this patient group. Which unfortunately I think means that the reality for most people with spina bifida is, is that to deal with their hydrocephalus, the, the shunt is going to be the way to deal with it. Now, Let's just do a little primer on shunts. But let me just pause there for a moment and say, are there any specific questions related to endoscopic third ventriculostomy? Yes, sir? I was wondering if you could put a stent in there that would prevent it from closing up. Yeah, it's a very good question. The bigger issue has more to do, there are definitely cases described where the hole closes. Okay? 
there definitely are cases, and initially we didn't think that occurred. And unfortunately, it took a few deaths for us to realize. I don't mean here, I just mean, you know, globally. Um, it took a few deaths for us to realize that the whole can block off. But the bigger problem with endoscopic third ventriculostomy is, number one, making the hole safely. And number two, having that just be an effective means of dealing with the spinal fluid. Some people just don't reabsorb well. So you can make a four-lane highway to the absorptive side, and if you don't absorb well, it doesn't help. And unfortunately, I think patients with spina bifida are disproportionately represented in that group as well. So it's not just a mechanical way of making a hole. Okay, but that's a good question. Okay, primers on the shunts. A lot of you live with shunts and probably know them better than I do. Ventricular catheter. Okay, a shunt has three parts. Okay, just regardless of what type of shunt, how complex, whatever. There's basically three components. The first part goes into the place where the cerebrospinal fluid needs to be drained from. The second part keeps the thing from draining too much. And the third part puts it into another body cavity where it can be reabsorbed. Okay? So regardless of what type of shunt you have, whether you have a five barrel super double complex backflip shunt, or you have a simple shunt that was put in when you were an infant, single barrel, you know, simple, those are, the con that, those, are the, those are the central concepts, okay? Something draining the fluid from the ventricle or the space where it needs to come from, a valve system of some nature, and a distal catheter, okay? And these are diagrams, okay? Most centrally, it's a, just a tube that allows spinal fluid to pass to another body cavity where it can be dealt with, okay? And if you remember that concept, then all of the multiple variations and permutations aren't overwhelming. Most of them go to the belly, as most of you know. About 80 or 90 percent are put in the belly. A small number are put in the heart. VA shunts have a bad reputation, and the reason why is because the complications associated with them are more severe. Okay? Now, VA shunts may work better than VP shunts. There is a very realistic possibility that that's the case. Okay? But the problem is with the distal end of the shunt in the bloodstream, any infection problem goes right to the bloodstream. And the fact that it's just a few centimeters from the heart valves makes the heart valves the next downstream thing that those bacteria hit. And so you can get, up, you can get a setup for bacterial endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart valves that takes weeks of antibiotics to treat, and it's very serious. So VA shunts have a bit of a bad reputation. But again, I want you to know, VA shunts came before VP shunts. And we treated kids, actually I shouldn't say we, this one came before me, but not that much before me. <laughs> VA shunts were successful in treating kids for probably 20 years before we got, no, nah, that's a bit of an exaggeration, 10 to 15 years before we got a lot of VP shunts going. VA shunts now are used in reserve for people who have had a lot of abdominal problems, okay? Particularly the newborn babies that are born with hemorrhages in their brain and get hydrocephalus often get an abdominal problem that goes with it called necrotizing enterocolitis, okay? Now, your population, patients with spina bifida, certainly can have their, their share of abdominal troubles related to bladder diversions and problems from that, okay? So there are reasons why the abdomen and the peritoneum become less desirable places to put the distal end of a shunt. But for the most part, in the spina bifida population, most shunts are VP shunts, unless there's been a lot of problems in the abdomen. Other options, occasionally we'll bide time by putting it in the pleura, okay? Some people, the pleura is the space between the chest wall and the lung. And in some people, they absorb fluid very well from that space. Most people don't. And some kids, man, put the shunt in there and the poor little kids fill up like a, like a quart bottle of milk. Bloop, fill right up, take it out. Didn't work. Some kids absorb from that space. We don't know very much science about that. Okay? And so, unfortunately, it's sort of a trial and error thing. Again, it's down the list of what we, of what we do. Then there's these weird things like V, v gallbladder shunts, and very few people do that. The subgaleal shunt is one that I just put on this slide just so that if you all were reading on the Internet or reading someplace and you heard about this term subgaleal shunts, you didn't have a hole in your knowledge. Now that I've said that, you can pretty much forget about it for your population. <laughs> okay? Subgaleal shunts is a little temporizing shunt that we use for little tiny babies. I mean, we've got babies upstairs that are literally this big. Okay? And they're too little for us to put in a... a peritoneal shunt. So like the chest 
space and the peritoneum, the space under the scalp has some capability to reabsorb fluid. So a subgaleal shunt just goes from the ventricle just underneath the scalp. It's a little tiny thing. It just works in the best of scenarios for a few weeks. But that few weeks is critical when you're this big because this big becomes that big in a few weeks' time and they become less fragile. So it's a temporizing shunt for, for ones that we use for kids that are real tiny, okay? On very rare occasions, we'll use them in other situations where we need to temporize. We've used them in trauma. We've used them in kids who have a bad cancer in their brain, things like that. But for the most part, they're a little tiny temporizing shunt we use in premature babies, okay? Now forget about it. Okay, so how do we put a shunt in? Well, this, this is sort of the basics of, of how we put a, put a, put a shunt in. Um, there's a variety of different ways to do this, and th this is designed to give you know, broad concepts, broad themes, not the specifics for your individual situation because there's a lot of variability. But the bottom line is, is that we want to have access to the, the belly, and we want to have access to the head, and we have to tunnel the shunt. So we have to position the patient in a very careful way. So the, in general, most people are placed in the what's called supine position where they're laying on the back and the head is turned. And there are four locations on the skull where we generally enter the, enter the ventricle, okay? Two in the front and two on the back on each side, okay? And those are the corridors through which ventricular access has been shown to be safe, okay? So um, we lay the person down. You can see this youngster laid down here. and I've actually put dots across his shunt track, which you can see. The orange is betadine soap that's been used as a pre-wash prep um, that we've done to um, just to wash him initially. We haven't finished the prep here. We usually initially wash and then wash with chlorhexidine, which is a pink-based soap. Um, we p position the person in such a way so that the mastoid uh, pardon me, the, the, the mastoid and the clavicle and the xiphoid are all on the same level so that we're not doing this. And that sounds obvious, and it is in a little skinny kid like this kid here, but in a, either a more robust, heavier person, something like that, it can be quite a challenge sometimes to get the positioning just right. And the reason that we want it just right is, is, that, when, is, is that the way that we get the shunt from the the head down to the belly is, is that we lift up the edge of the skin and we pass a long tunneling device which is about the diameter of a, of a pen but it's about that long and it's, it, it's got a metal stylet down the middle of it and it has a clear plastic sleeve around the outside so we lift the skin up and with practice it becomes very straightforward to do to, to pass that but we don't want to be riding the roller coaster at Six Flags to do that. We want a nice straight shot so that it's safe. Shunts are a lot more pleasant to put in when we don't have misadventures wandering into the chest or the big vessels of the neck. So we put the ventricular catheter in based on some anatomic landmarks. Kids with large ventricles, it's actually with, with proper training and a bit of experience, it's actually quite straightforward to, to hit a large ventricle. We have some technologic things that help us if the ventricles are small. And then we've come to now use this technique that's being demonstrated on this slide of, of what's called endoscopy to help us confirm that we've got the catheter in a nice position. And this is where technology has really given us something worthwhile because on a 1.2 millimeter stylet, I mean it's literally as thin as a piece of wire, we, th we have a very nice camera and a light source. And so it goes right down the barrel of the shunt and we can drive the shunt catheter right into the ventricle and we become very familiar with what it looks like. And if you look on this slide, you see the TV monitor there just slightly to the right. You see the sort of black hole in the middle of it. Well, you're, we're looking through the tip of that shunt. The white circle around it is the tip of the shunt and the little black beyond that is inside this child's ventricle. And we're driving around trying to get that catheter tip position in exactly where we want it. And this is, a I won't say eliminated, we still end up with a one or two where the, the shunt catheter tip is like, how in the world did it get there? But, but for the most part, it's eliminated the mispositioning of ventricular catheters. Now, we've never scientifically shown that it makes a difference for the catheter tip to be in an optimum position, but every pediatric neurosurgeon believes that to the core of their gut. The catheter tip position 
the catheter tip position matters. How about valves? Well, again, it's one of those things where intuitively one would think well, you got this complex thing in line in the shunt, the valve should be the point of greatest fragility and should be the source of the most errors. Nothing could be further from the truth. Valves tend to work. Eight out of ten shunt revisions that are not for infection, more than eight, push a nine, 83, 84 percent of shunt revisions are from the ventricular catheter becoming occluded with that sugar and protein debris from within the ventricle. These valves these valves have a tendency to work. And it's interesting because if you look at the history of shunts, the valves have, the engineers have gone nuts on these valves. They've had flow regulated valves and pressure cone valves and ruby cone valves and spring loaded valves and, you know, this valve, that valve, the other valve, programmable valves. A multi center prospective trial that was organized through the group at Salt Lake City a few years ago called the Shunt Design Trial showed conclusively that one valve doesn't really work that much better than the others. Okay? Now, will you hear something different from those who sell valves? Sure. Is that scientifically valid? Probably not. But both collectively in terms of multi-center organized trials and individually large centers are kind of coming to the conclusion that even though this is the most technologically advanced part it appears to be the part of the, that works just fine. I put this slide in always as a reminder because some people come from centers. One of the controversies is, to the, is the contribution of the so-called programmable valve. Now this, this is admittedly, the ones that I've diagrammed here are admittedly a little bit outdated because this technology is a pretty fast moving target and the companies that make these programmable valves are, are frequently updating them. So it's kind of like your cell phone. If I take the picture now and show it to you by next, you know, next year it'll be outdated. But conceptually I think it's important that you have an understanding of this. There are some neurosurgeons, neurosurgery groups, and some patients that feel strongly that it is an advantage to the patient and to the family to be able to vary the outflow resistance of the valve. In other words, to change how much, to change how, at what pressure the valve opens. And those are so-called programmable valves, okay? Our group, the group here at Children's, does not embrace this. I don't think personally that programmable valves offer one thing of substance to the, to the uh, spina bifida population or the vast majority of kids that have hydrocephalus. There may be a role for this technology. In fact, there probably is a role for this technology in adults with hydrocephalus with a different type of hydrocephalus. There's a type of hydrocephalus that comes on to older adults, so-called normal pressure hydrocephalus, which, as the title would indicate, the pressure in the ventricles is not elevated. But it's a, it's a form of dementing illness that occurs in fifth, sixth, seventh generation adults that's characterized by some very specific findings, and these patients become progressively demented. There is some pretty good evidence to suggest that being able to very carefully program the outflow pressure resistance for these patients may be of some considerable value. We have not embraced this because of a couple of sort of cardinal ideas in our practice. First and foremost, as I've told you already, the most common site for shunt problems is the ventricular catheter tip. So. If you think about the ventricular catheter tip sitting there functioning but gradually taking on, in some patients, gradually taking on a protein and sugar residue and becoming progressively more obstructed. If you think of a shunt in order for it to work as having to flow sort of over two fences, which is basically what these resistances would represent, varying the outflow resistance this much is simply distracting if the outflow resistance from the ventricular catheter is greater. So we are more concerned about the potential for this covering up ventricular catheter obstruction. We think the negative of that eclipses any of the favorable stuff from 
being able to vary the pressures. I gave a talk similar to this and showed this slide. I've forgotten which national spina bifida meeting it was, but one of the last couple of national spina bifida meetings at which my friend and colleague Mike Partington, who does pediatric neurosurgery in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I shared that with, at that point, and Mike was standing in the back and I said, so our, in Birmingham, our utilization of programmable valves is 0%. Don't you agree, Mike? What's your use of programmable valves? He said it's 100%. So it didn't feel too good at the moment when I was on the podium. But it exemplifies well for you guys the point that there is variability on this perspective, okay? That some practices embrace the notion of programmable shunts more than others. We don't. I feel strongly in that. Salt Lake City doesn't. They're another, they're probably the, they and us are probably the two largest groups out there right now. I don't know what Boston does. But um, it's something you need to know about. But I don't. But like endoscopic third ventriculostomy, I would strongly encourage you to approach the notion of programmable valves with a very healthy measure of reserve. Okay. Well, I don't know why I put these slides in because shunts never have any complications, right? Okay. So what can happen? Well, as you all know, shunts can block. And the picture on the bottom shows what happens or what can happen after a shunt has sat in the ventricle for a while. What that is is, is that that's a clump of choroid plexus that's scarred to the tip of the shunt. And despite us being very careful in removing it, got torn in coming out. And the valve at the top shows what happens. See how it's filled with blood? And there's blood in the ventricular catheter. 50% of shunts will fail within a year, 75% will fail. That's actually an error. It's not within five years, it's within two years. So shunts fail. Shunts get blocked. The most common place we've talked about already, ventricular catheter. It's usually holes in the ventricular catheter that get occluded. It's much more uncommon for holes in the distal catheter to get occluded, but when they do, they can get occluded by scar. Problems in the distal end, you've got to think about infection. Okay? If there's problems in the abdomen, the, the notion of infection should come to mind. So I mentioned this before about whether or not pl placement, uh, placement, optimum placement, does that, prevent, does that prevent the shunt from becoming obstructed? Intuitively, yes, but the data is, is decidedly mixed. Well, why can't we design a catheter that doesn't get obstructed? How about making the holes bigger? We've done that. That just makes the choroid plexus grow into it all the more vigorously and gives you a lot more of these choroid plexus lollipops. How about one, there, there's a catheter that was made for a few years that we refer to now as we look on the scan with a certain amount of dread when we see it because it's a catheter that for all the world looks like a honey dipper where they put some silastic, some extra tubing around the holes. They built it up. You, you all have seen those honey dippers where you dip the thing into the, the honey and it picks it up on the, on the sides. It's a little extra fat end around the catheter. Man, that sucker grabs onto choroid plexus like nobody's business. Well intended, completely unhelpful. So a variety of things have been tried to prevent this. Right now we have a system where we have small holes in rows on the ventricular catheter seems to work better than the others as far as preventing choroid plexus ingrowth, but it's the weak point of the hourglass. Infections are a very significant cause of problems. We do everything we possibly can to prevent it from happening. That being said, we cause 80% of them. Why? It is impossible to sterilize the skin for a long time. We have sweat glands. We have other glands that bring material up from below the surface of the skin onto the surface of the skin, despite the antiseptic solutions that we use to scrub the patient vigorously with. Okay? Every surgical field has a certain amount of bacteria in it, despite all the precautions, despite the IV antibiotics, despite two pairs of gloves, despite irrigation, despite all these other things. And it is in every surgical field, it is a battle between the patient's immune system and the amount of bacteria that are present. 
the number of bacteria that can be present in a, in a surgical field as a shunt is way lower than if we're doing something else because the patient has an immune capability. Okay? Most groups report about an 8% rate of shunt infection. This is an area where we're making little bits of progress, but I mean this is little bits, 5 to 6 to 8% is where most groups are reporting. Sometimes you'll see reports of 8, 10, 12%. So what is that? Are we getting better or are the groups that are reporting 8, 10, 12% looking harder and being more honest? Don't know. Rates of infection, higher in spina bifida patients. No question, unequivocally. Whole variety of different reasons, right? In the babies, in some of the, in, in the babies, um, they have immature immune systems. In older people, some of the continence issues change the bacterial flora present on the skin, okay? Some issues of skin competency some issues of obesity, all these issues impact shunt infection rates. Oops, you guys didn't really want me to talk about tethered cord today, did you? Okay, so what do we do? We prep the skin, we get rid of any simultaneous infections, we give IV antibiotics, we have a series of very rigid protocols that we follow. This is really being looked at in a very careful way. We in Birmingham participate in a multi-centered hydrocephalus research network along with Salt Lake City, Houston, um, Toronto, and I think it's Seattle. And we're looking at these things in a prospective, carefully, carefully controlled way. This is the way to answer these questions. Things that seem self-evident are, but aren't absolutely. Does that make sense? So washing your hands, does that make a difference? Yes, absolutely. But if you wash your hands twice, will all the shunt infections go away? No. Giving antibiotics reduces the rate. It doesn't eliminate it. Okay, so shunt infection is a very multifactorial problem. A lot of different things come together to cause a shunt infection. Each little thing contributes to it. Infection, other infection, obesity, skin prep, how the skin is handled surgically. Do, do you injure the tissue and compromise blood flow to the tissue? Okay. All right. So... How do we evaluate someone who comes in with what looks to be a shunt problem? Okay. Well, one thing I think that's real important to know is, is that CT is helpful, but it's not the only answer. Okay. CT, the shunt can fail, easily 10 to 15 percent, and we think we've got an abstract together for the pediatric section meeting for this year looking at our experience that shows that up to 30% of kids with spina bifida can fail with no, no significant change in the ventricles. And it's our belief that symptoms from an experienced family trump imaging in terms of the quality for evaluation. I will take your kid to the operating room if the symptoms are right and we have the right understanding between us regardless of what the CT shows. Well, why bother getting the CT and exposing the kid to the radiation? Well, it makes the decision making easier for everybody. If the ventricles are up, nobody second guesses themselves. Okay? So we get a CT scan to look at the ventricles. We're moving away from CT imaging more toward fast sequence MRI because we want to get away from all the radiation. We've got it set up at Children's South now. The kids that follow with me in my clinic at Children's South, we can get a fast sequence MRI in five minutes. You have to lay still for five minutes instead of 45. Okay? No radiation. I can see the ventricles well. Can't see the shunt quite as well, but I can see the shunt on a plain shunt series. And I'm filming that anyway. So start asking your neurosurgeons. Okay? We'll get them both ways. I'll bug them, I'll bug them in the morning report. You bug them when you talk to them. So we're moving away from CT. We're moving more to fast sequence MRI. Okay? We get a CT scan in the acute setting because it's quick, it's straightforward, and it shows us what we need to know, okay? But easily 10 to 15 percent, that's the number you'll see out there, but it may be higher than that. 10 to 15 percent can fail with no CT change, okay? So just because the CT doesn't, if you've got a neurosurgeon that says, uh, your shunt's not having a problem because the CT is unchanged, that's maybe somebody who doesn't have as much experience with spina bifida as you're going to want, need, and should demand. Okay, I'm going to skip this for the moment, and that as well. 
Okay, in the remaining, Betsy just put her hands up and went like this, so I have now less, just less than 10 minutes. So we've got 10 minutes on telecord. Yes, sir? Sure. That's a very good question. So that for those who couldn't hear, the question pertains to, it's, there seems to be a real phenomenon that the incidence of shunt problems goes down as the child enters into adulthood. Okay? That seems to be the case. We believe that is the case. We hope that it is not an issue of insufficient and proper follow-up in adults. I don't think that's the case, but that's one we always worry about. Okay? We don't know. That's the bottom line. We don't know. But it does seem that across the board, not just for myelomeningocele, but for other disease processes as well, that adults do seem to have fewer problems with their shunts than children. And there's a lot of interesting questions that that raises. It is a, it is, it is a well-recognized phenomenon for which we don't have good answers at this point. So I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about tethered cord now, okay? I only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Um, but because um, I, I want to leave a, a few minutes for, for questions, okay? So when we have a baby born with this problem at the beginning, it's probably not a big surprise that that child's going to have a low-lying cord, okay? So we will repair this, and we're going to do one of these this afternoon. We've got a little baby upstairs. It's not this one, but we've got another one. But the initial repair doesn't raise the cord up and get the cord back to its normal natural position. It covers it up and prevents the leak of spinal fluid, prevents, lowers the risk of meningitis, but it doesn't prevent the, it doesn't prevent the occurrence of tethered cord. To understand tethered cord, you have to understand that neural tissue and non-neural tissue grow at different rates of speed. Neural tissue is wonderful. It's magical tissue, but it's very slow growing. Muscle and bone grows faster, so that in the practical world, the spinal cord grows more slowly than the surrounding spinal canal and column. The bone and muscle that surrounds the cord grows more quickly. So that if you had a time-lapsed photograph of a child from the time they're born to the time they're about eight years old, the spinal cord would be seen to rise up in the canal. Does it actually rise up? No. What happens is the canal outgrows it, but over time-lapse view, it would look to rise up. Now think if something were to grab hold of that cord that wants to rise up and grab hold of it. It could not rise up and the cord would come under tension. The cord would be what? Tethered. Neural tissue doesn't do well when it's put under pressure or when it's put under tension. That is tethered cord. That's it. Those are the concepts. So anything that tethers the cord and does not allow it to rise up is tethered cord. Okay? You have a child, like the one I showed you, whose back is exposed. We close it surgically. We close it carefully. Scar forms there. No surprise, gang. You get scar formation between what we just did and the placo, the spinal cord, that cannot rise. Okay? That's a tethered cord. Okay? So any mechanism that fixates the cord and parts that longitudinal traction over time, that's tethered cord. Okay? So my friend Robin Bowman I alluded to earlier, that's Children's Memorial Hospital. Her predecessor was a very famous neurosurgeon, probably the most accomplished person in spina bifida, David McClone. Their series, huge number of patients treated with spina bifida, 500 patients treated between the last quarter of the 20th century. 20, about 23 percent, about a quarter of kids require tethered cord release, okay? Most of them, 70 percent or so, once a smaller percent twice, three times, et cetera, from there, okay? Usually it's around seven. Why? Growth spurt, okay? Other abnormalities can do this, okay? It's obvious why a closed myelomeningocele would tether, but there are a family of abnormalities that are in the um, neural tube defects of which myelomeningocele is the, is, or open spina bifida is the most severe. There are other closed forms of this disease process where developmentally the body gets confused and you can think of it as when the body gets confused it lays fat down 
and the fat is a fibro fatty, is a fibrous, very fatty tissue. It has nothing to do with calories or, or energy expended. It's a neural, it's a developmental anomaly. And this fibrous fatty tissue similarly goes into the spinal cord and tethers it in place. Okay, so that's another mechanism. It's not open spina bifida, it's not open my myelomeningocele, but it's in the same family, okay? Same family of problems. A little bit less serious is the so-called dermal sinus tract. It's a thin tube of fibrous tissue between the skin and the distal part of the spinal cord, okay? Same idea, tethering mechanism, same problems. That's what they look like up on the top. See the lump of fat under the skin? See the little skin hemangioma on the top? The skin is the marker of the underlying nervous system. Okay, the MRI scan there shows that area of white that goes into the cord there. That's the lipoma. And then the drawing underneath it shows that lump of fatty, fibrous tissue that goes in. It's also called a lipomyelomeningocele. Those that want to read more about it, we wrote a review article, I think it was 2003, in Neurosurgery Focus. Scott Elton and I wrote it. It's called uh, spinal lipoma. So if, if anybody you know or, or care about has these problems, everything all, is all detailed there. That's what they look like. Sorry for the gross surgical pictures, but that shows you it, the fibro fatty tissue going into the spinal cord and tethering it. Just showing some more variations on this. These are all members of the family. Don't worry about that big long word up top. Diastomatomyelia is just a bony fibrous spike. Again, a de developmental anomaly that tethers the cord. This is the more common so-called dermal sinus tract that goes in. And again, looking at that MRI up there, you see if you look very carefully through that, through that long mound of white, you see the thin little pencil line of black. That's the dermal sinus tract going and tethering the cord. I'm going to skip fatty phylum. So what's it do? What's a tethered cord cause? Back pain and a progressive gradual decline in lower extremity function, of which the bladder is the most sensitive function below the chest. Okay, so it's the most vulnerable function. So bladder studies are most valuable. However, it is overwhelmingly a clinical diagnosis and we take pictures to confirm where we're gonna go. It gives us a surgical roadmap. Functional analysis of bladder function is our most valuable test. But my colleagues, Dr. Joseph, Dr. Kitchens, Dr. Herndon, will warn us that these are subjective tests that require an experienced, competent team to administer them and experience in interpreting them. This is not a black and white phenomenon. These tests need to be done by experienced, careful people and interpreted carefully. But they are very valuable in terms of determining whether or not there's been functional decline that should prompt us to recommend on tethering. Okay, so how do we go about fixing it? Well, what we do is we open up, expose everything surgically, and go in and basically disconnect whatever scar tissue is there. There is one very important codicil, and I looked through your notes this morning, and I was very pleased to see them, see that it was there. Not in the notes surrounding my section, but in the notes farther back in your binder tab, talking about chunts, tethered spinal cord symptoms can be a sign of what? Shunt, shunt, shunt. Remember Jack Walker, it's always the shunt, stupid. Okay? You've got to make sure the shunt is okay before you go undertaking a tethered cord intervention. Okay, does that mean operating on the back is wrong? No. What it means is you've got to be very careful in working out individually with your or your child's neurosurgeon and urologist exactly what the symptoms are, exactly what the, um, the urodynamics look like, and what the shunt function appears to be, and work out a plan that's reasonable. It is not excessive to explore the shunt before untethering the cord. Does that mean every neurosurgeon does this? No. What does that mean when you get into this kind of variability in approach, folks? It means you're up against the edge of collective understanding. You're up against the edge of collective understanding when different, well-trained, committed groups or individuals of both practitioners and families and patients practice different ways. 
It means we don't have all the answers for that. But broadly, across the country, across North America, particularly less in, in Europe, but there is an evolving and increasingly widely embraced notion that tethered cord symptoms can and often are tip of the iceberg for a shunt problem. Okay. Betsy's going to start jumping up and down and yelling at me here in a minute, so I've got to wrap up. So what works, what is most responsive for spinal cord tethering? Pain. 80% of kids with tethered spinal cord will have pain. Do I worry about them? No. Why? Because a kid with pain will come to the office. I worry about the 20% that are tethered that don't have pain. How do they show up? Deborah Perry. Declining urological function. Increasing urinary tract infections. Okay? So pain is first. Decline. I, ever, I ask every kid I see in spina bifida clinic, is there anything you cannot do now that you could do a year ago? Can you control your bladder? How, how do you manage your bladder? Do you self-cath? Do you avoid in the toilet? Is this different than it was six months ago? Is this different than it was a year ago? If there's a significant change there, we need to look at it carefully. That's, those are the differences between top flight, in my view, top flight care for the patient with spina bifida and going through the motions. Anybody can pick up a kid who's, head, who's headachy and sleepy and throwing up. But it's those nuanced differences of picking up the 20% of tethers that don't present with pain, picking up the kid whose shunt is failed, whose CT is not changed. Those are the differences that you want to make in yourself or your child or your loved one that we want to make at this center to be a top right, to be a top right center. All right, I know, Betsy. Okay. And I think that's it. Questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say it again. Shunt failure. Yeah. No, I think it's 50% within, within a year, and it's like 70% within two years. That's from shunt placement. Yeah, that's from shunt placement. Unfortunately, revision is not a whole lot cheerier picture. So, I mean, is that something to get depressed about? Yes and no. Okay. The reality is, I mean, shunts are imperfect. We, we enter into this knowing that, and we say, okay, if the shunt fails, we'll deal with that one step at a time when that happens, and we'll get your kid back where they need to be. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Mm hmm Yes. Yep. 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 I'll repeat this. Okay. So the for those that didn't hear, um, your son has one of the variants that we alluded to, okay? It's a, it's a variant of malformed distal neural tube and some other structures. And you underwent an untethering early and you, you're worried about what to watch for. Well, the symptoms in those kids, well, first of all, prophylactic untethering is totally appropriate and indicated in those, in those kids with that particular syndrome because they reliably tether. Okay, they have such a high incidence of tether that it can be expected. You can fairly well say they will tether, and that so prophylactic untethering is, is totally appropriate. The thing to watch for is the same constellation in the sense that about three quarters of them will have pain, but all but what we watch for is that deterioration in bowel bladder. But bowel is late, so it's typically bladder. Bladder is more sensitive, or less commonly, lower extremity loss, okay? They become more clumsy. They used to walk foot over foot when they went up the stairs. Now they walk catch up. You see what I'm saying? Little subtle things like that. So focus. The challenge is to be a focused, um, attentive parent without being an obsessive parent. And that's, no, and that's, I don't say that, I say that empathically, empathetically, that's what I'm saying. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, here's what I'll, let me do this. Anything that pertains to a specific situation, let me just refer to sort of the clinical, you know, situation, the, the clinical team that you're with right now or talk to you individually. Let me just see this because my time really is, are there any conceptual things that don't pertain to a specific patient? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay, good question. So the question pertains to uh, can I pull out a little bit more about the neck pain symptoms. Um, what most of the kids talk about is it's, is it's, a, is, is it's, it's like a headache. It's, it's a headache, but it's a headache that's at the craniocervical junction, okay? Um, so if this, is, it, this is not something that is usually subtle, okay? It's something that's typically recurrent. It's something that's pretty significant, um, but wh where, where we've been concerned is it being, it's, it, if it's not in your head, it's not your shunt. That's an error, okay? Neck pain, it's basically like if, if your head, <laughs> it's that same headache that falls 10 inches to the back, okay? Base of the skull into the neck, yep, exactly. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Tim's laughing at me because he knows how difficult this question is. Um, in practical terms, kids, there, let me say it this way. There's a lot about tether we don't understand. I explained it in very straightforward terms as though it's, as though it's all well understood. The concepts that I gave you, the notions that I gave you fit, work, and are largely correct. But it's just like the, the shunt infection thing. What I said is true, but it's part of the truth, and there, there's a lot of truth we don't understand about tether, okay? So how come it doesn't just re-tether? Well, every, every Milo kid, every kid we close will tether, 100%. Well, how come only 30% need to be untethered? I don't know. We don't know. Once I, re -un once I untether someone, will they form scar? Sure, their wound's going to heal. So what's happening on the outside to close their wound up is sure happening on the inside. Will they likely retether? Well, there's little tricks we do surgically that may slightly decrease the incidence of that, but yeah, they probably retether. So as with many things with the body, the, the, the reality is probably a lot more complex than our explanations completely account for. So I can't answer all of it, but clinically we observe that the incidence of re-untether, re-untether, re-untether goes down. Now, some of that is, some of that is, the, most of that's the fact that the symptoms go away. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Betsy's going to give me the hook. <laughs> Thank you for attending this session. Because meeting your needs is important to us, we need your feedback on this presentation. Please take a few moments to complete our evaluation, which can be located by clicking on the presenter's name located to the left on your screen. It will only take a few clicks of your mouse to provide us information to make the SBU experience better for you and others. If you have any questions relating to SBU, please contact us at sbu at sbaa.org.